Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to Edisite Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in development biology, we will be talking about gametogenesis. To discuss this topic, we have with us our subject expert, Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat. Dr. Rawat is assistant professor in department of zoology in Ramjas College, University of Delhi. Without further ado, I would like to welcome ma'am to our studios and request her to start the lecture. Welcome ma'am. Thank you. So, uh, when a female and a male mate, the fusion of the gametes take place. The gametes which are the, you know, sex uh, or the sex cells which are there, when the fusion of the gametes take place and then which is a sperm and an ova and then the development of a male or a female occurs. So, that is like the continuity of life. So, when a male and female comes together, and then male and female where there is a sexual dimorphism in the species, they mate, their gametes fuse together to give rise to a new individual. So this is basically the continuity of life that the, uh, the germ cells are this essence of this continuity of life. So today we will talking, we'll be talking about how these gametes are formed. So the specific learning objectives for today would be to understand the two modes of germ cell specification the germplasm and induction, to understand determination of primordial germ cells, the PGCs, and to understand the migration of PGCs into the developing gonads. So to start with, what are the two modes of germ cell specification? One is called as the germplasm. So germ cells are basically the cells which are giving rise to the gametes. The gametes, as you know, as I've been telling that there is a sexual dimorphism, so there will be a male gamete and a female gamete which will fuse together to give rise to an entire individual. So one of the specification mode for these germ cells that, you know, they are destined to form the male or the female gamete is the germplasm. And the second mechanism is called as the induction. So the first mode, which is the germplasm states that in many animals such as roundworms, insects, and vertebrates, the germ line, which is a population of body cells so differentiated that in the process of reproduction, they may pass their genetic material to the next progeny, develops separately from the somatic line, the population of body cells that are not in the germ line. The germ cells originate from their precursor cells termed the primordial germ cells. So the germ line is giving rise to the germ cells, you know, the, the cells which are going to be forming the gametes, the male and female gametes that is termed as the germ line, which is set apart by, by the somatic line, which give rise to rest of the cells of the body. The germ cells originate from the precursor cells, which are called as the primordial germ cells. And in frogs, nematodes and flies, PGCs are specified autonomously by the cytoplasmic determinants, the specific proteins and mRNAs in the egg. These cytoplasmic components of the egg, which later become part of the specified cells during cleavage, are collectively termed as the germplasm. So germplasm is that side, those cytoplasmic determinants which are already present in the egg and these components of the egg later become part of the germ cells which will give rise to the gametes and which will give rise to during the you know cell division, the cleavage part when it will occur, then it is going to give rise to the germ cells which is there. So that cytoplasm of the egg, that portion of cytoplasm of the egg is termed as the germplasm. So this is kind of a, you know, preformation. Uh, it's referring to such as a preformation theory that, you know, these determinants are already present in the egg and they form the part of the germ cells which are going to be formed. Another mode of germ cell specification which is found in animals like salamanders and mammals is conditional and the germ cells are specified by interactions among the neighboring cells by cell cell signaling. So it is kind of an inductive mechanism. So the germ cells are not defined right at the onset of the development or you know it's not there are no cytoplasmic determinants which are present in the egg but a cell tends to become a germ cell when it is influenced by the neighboring cell. So it's a kind of an inductive mechanism. So we'll look at both the mode of germ cell specification in this particular session. 
So this is the mechanism of primordial gel specification as I am talking about. So one is there is a preformation pre that you know these kind of RNPs which are already present in the egg and these egg when this you know the egg gets fertilized by a sperm and there is a cleavage or the cell division is occurring then a certain uh, a uh, certain number of cells will receive the, these RNPs or these uh, cytoplasmic determinants and those cells will form the germ cells and then there will be a primordial germ cells which are there. In the epigenesis which is basically an inductive mechanism there is no pre-PGC factors which are present in the egg and as you can see there will be they will be uh, you know some of the cells will be induced to form the primordial germ cells that will give rise to the germ cells and in the adult they will give rise to the gonads. So these are the two different mechanisms or modes of germ cell specification that how do that occur. So germplasm theory was a theory of heredity which was given by August Wiseman. In the germplasm, Wiseman proposed a theory of heredity based on the concept of the germplasm which is a substance in the germ cell that carries the hereditary information. So this is a very uh, famous book by August Weissman, The Germplasm, A Theory of Heredity, which was published in 1893. Uh, Weissman postulates that there are four hierarchic hierarchical levels of substances in the cell, the biophores, the determinants, the eads and the idants. The biophores are minute units that collectively make up the whole cell and Weismann postulated that they directed the cell's metabolism and growth. So basically biophores referred to the various kind of chemical molecules which are there in the cell. Determinants are the primary constituents of the hereditary substance. Aggregates of many determinants were called as ids. And at the highest level are what are called as idents, which are the aggregates of these ids. ids. The concept of idents correspond to the concept of chromosome. So he described these hierarchical levels of substances in the cell, the biophores, the determinants, the eads and the idents. And they said that because of these determinants, you know, uh, they, uh, they are the primary constituents of the hereditary substances which are there. So he uses those four concepts of biophores, determinants, eads and idents to explain the heredity and developmental phenomena in various sexual and asexual organism. The germplasm triggered debates among and uh, influenced 20th century researchers and Weismann's distinction between the germ cells and the soma cells became called as the Weismann barrier. So he, he gave the concept of this germplasm that you know there are some kind of determinants which are present which aggregates to form the eads and finally the idans which are basically the chromosomes and therefore they are the ones which are passing on. So they are the germ cells you know which they are they are the uh, constituents which will be passed on to the germ cell which was there. And although there were many debates related to it but this germ line germ cells and soma uh, cells were called as the Weismann barrier which was basically there. So germ cell is specified in these two manner. The next comes that how the germ cells are determined. So Bovary's experiments you know there was Theodore Bovary a famous scientist and he gave an actual manifestation of the germ for the germplasm theory. So experimentally he provided the evidence for the germplasm theory which was there. He studied the development of the roundworm Parascaris aquarium and the first division plane of Parascaris zygote is equatorial separating the animal and vegetal pole which can be distinguished based on the yolk granules as it is shown here. In the animal blastomere the chromosomes ends disappear and only the central portion remains intact. So you know after the division there was an equatorial division the two cells were formed and then the animal pole cells were basically there was chromosome diminution which is called as you know the terminal part of the chromosomes they just disappear. Uh, chromosomal diminution occurred in the vegetal blastomere however the chromosome remained normal. During the second cleavage the animal cells split meridionally, meridionally while the vegetal cell again divides equatorially as can be seen in the diagram. Initially both vegetally, vegetally derived cells have normal chromosomes but chromosomes of the more animally located cell amongst these eventually undergo diminution uh, before the third cleavage. So as you can see at the fourth cell stage only one cell the most vegetal contained the intact chromosomes. 
At the 16 cell stage, only two blastomeres contain intact chromosomes. One of them eventually undergoes chromosome diminution and give rise to more somatic cells, while the other one where there was no chromosomal diminution occurred, it gave rise to the germ cells. Thus, the chromosomes are cap kept intact only in those cells which are destined to become the germ cells. So, this was one of the experiments which August Weissman did. And in fact, what he did was he tried to centrifuge the, uh, you know, if, if, if there was any uh, germ plasm which was there and which was residing in this vegetal most cell, inhibiting the chromosome diminution, then to, uh, you know, uh, to make substantiate this point, what he did was he centrifuged the, uh, uh, the zygote and then uh, it went on to have the divisions. So as you can see that, you know, that material was lying on the base. And then where there was no chromosomal diminution in both the cells after the first cleavage because now both of them contained the material. And in fact, at the four cell stage, the two which received this, you know, dark uh, purple portion, they were not, the chromosomal diminution did not occur. So based on these experiments, Bovary concluded that the vegetal cytoplasm, which is basically the germ plasm, contained factors that inhibit chromosome diminution and that thus determines the germ cells. So, it also makes sense, you know, because the germ cells are the ones which are going to give rise to the gametes and then gametes will fuse together to give rise to the next generation. So, the chromosomal diminution was inhibited in the cells which are going to be forming the germ cells because they are the continuity of life. So, chromosomal diminution could occur in other cells but not in the, uh, in the germ cells which are destined to become the germ cells. So, this was a very, very good evidence for the in, the, in favor of the germ plasm theory. So, we will look at germ cell determination in some organisms. In C. elegans, uh, ribonucleoprotein complexes termed pre-P granules specify the germ cells. After fertilization, the randomly scattered P granules located at the posterior end of the zygote and enter the cell formed from the posterior cytoplasm which is termed P1. So, at a two cell stage you can see that the P granules which are you know uh, luminescent are only present in the germline cell of P1. So, when this P1 is uh, you know on subsequent division the P granules you can see pass from the P1 to P2 and then P2 cell to P3 cell and then ultimately reside in the P4 cell whose progeny eventually give rise to the gametes which are the sperms and the eggs of the adult. So, that is how the germ cell determination happens in the case of C. elegans. Germ cell determination in insects in Drosophila at the ninth cellular division, PGCs form as a group of pole cells at the posterior region of the developing embryo. So, you can see that Drosophila embryo pole cells is uh, visible at the posterior end. These nuclei migrate to the posterior region and get surrounded by the pole plasm which is termed as the germ plasm. The pole plasm is composed of mitochondria, fibrils and polar granules. The polar granules contain specific RNAs and proteins which play essential role in the germ cell formation. So, in case of drosophila, it is basically you know the pole cells which are located at the posterior end which will give rise to the germ cells or the it is basically the germ line which is there. In case of fishes, in vertebrate embryos also have localized germ cell cytoplasmic determinants. For example, in zebra fish, the germ plasm is composed of uh, polar granules, mitochondria and mRNAs that is localized in the cleavage furrows of the early dividing egg. So, you can see the one cell lateral view, the one cell animal view, you can see the, the two uh, arrows basically correspond or the two arrows point out towards the um, to, uh, towards the cytoplasmic determinant which is present at the furrow which is going to give rise to the germ cells which is there. So, in the two cell lateral also, so these arrows at the furrows is basically representing the cytoplasmic determinants which are already there. So, at late cleavage the germ plasm gets localized only in four cells and subsequently divide to give rise to four clusters of PGC. So, you can see in the uh, 4000 cell stage there are basically four clusters which are randomly you know they are not defined by any plane. Uh, they are uh, four uh, clusters of these uh, uh, pre primordial germ cells are localized in the um, uh, in the uh, zebra fish uh, growing embryo which is there. So, that is how the germ cell determination takes place in zebra fish. 
In amphibians, the germplasm is localized in the vegetal region of the fertilized egg. It consists of germinal granules and a matrix around them. In unfertilized egg, the germplasm consists of small islands that are attached to the yolk mass near the vegetal cortex. After fertilization, these islands move with the yolk mass during cortical rotation. The post-cortical rotation, the islands are released, fused together and move towards the vegetal pole. So, we will get into the detail of the cleavage as well as the, uh, you know, how uh, the gastrulation occurs in case of amphibians. But right now to understand this thing is when the fertilization is happening, when a sperm enters the egg in case of amphibian, there is a phenomena which is called as the cortical rotation that occurs. So, this cortical rotation, you know, there are different islands which are there. There are uh, um, islands that move with the yolk mass during the cortical relate, uh, rotation and these islands are released, they fuse together and then move towards the vegetal pole. So, as shown in the figure, you know that uh, black part which are initially in the furrows and then finally localized in the uh, most vegetal pole is basically constituting the uh, germ plasma and that will give rise to the germ cells basically which is there. So, looking at germ cell determination in birds, there is no germ plasma that has been demonstrated in the early bird embryo. Earliest avian germ cells could be identified at the OV position when they are distributed in the central region of the unincubated embryo. During the formation of the two layers, blastula, we will see, we will under, we will, uh, you know, uh, look at the development of chick. So, we will look at the uh, development of blastula and uh, uh, the development uh, as far as the gastrulation is concerned. So, we will get into detail of that, but at this point it is important to understand that there are two layers which are formed. There is a two layered blastula which is formed, the one which is called as the epiblast and another which is called as the hypoblast. So, germ cells from the epiblast, they translocate with other ingressing somatic cells to the hypoblast. So, when the gastrulation is occurring, when this epiblast is ingressing, you know it is going inside then this somatic cells which are going inside, the germ cells also go along with them. As development continues, the hypoblast containing PGCs is basically displaced anteriorly to a crescent shaped extra embryonic region termed the germinal crescent located between area pellucida and area opaca. So, you, all you have to understand right now is that in the egg of an, uh, in a egg of a chick or egg of a bird basically, egg of a chick we are talking about here. There are two areas that develop in the fertilized egg. The central one which is you know translucent is termed as the area pellucida and the outer one is termed as the area opaca. So, the figure clearly shows that you know the PGCs from the epiblast that translocate later are carried to the anterior region by the developing mesoderm. And as you can see, you know, initially this blue color, which is the redistribution of PGC's representation, then in the first stage, it's basically, you know, diffused, then it is present everywhere. In the HH5 state, we'll talk about the different stages. It's see, seen as a germinal crescent on the anterior portion of it. So, the PGCs are in contact with the endoderm, the connection which they soon lose and become surrounded by the mesodermal cells. These mesodermal cells subsequently form blood islands that facilitate the next phase of migration to the gonads. So, germ cell determination in birds occur in this manner that they along with the somatic cells, they tend to be ingressed inside and then along with the mesodermal cells, the epiblast cells which is translocated towards the anterior region of the uh, growing embryo, uh, these germ cells will also move anteriorly and they will form a kind of a germinal crest. So, in the, uh, initially they are uh, uh, in contact with the endoderm, but then they become in contact with the mesoderm and uh, you know they become the mesodermal cells and the mesodermal cells will give rise to the blood islands and through the blood they will migrate to the gonads, developing gonads where they will be then differentiate into the uh, into the gametes, the egg or the uh, sperm. So, that is how basically the uh, germ cell determination in birds takes place. So, germ cell determination in mammals, if we look at, there is again no evident germ plasm in mammals. The germ cells are rather induced in the embryo. So, they follow what is called as the induction mechanism. In mice, for example, around 6.25 days post coitum, 6 PGC precursors are set aside in the posterior proximal epiblast cells at the junction of the extra embryonic ectoderm. 
epiblast, primitive streak and allantois. So, you know the, uh, the, uh, the portion which is nearer to the, uh, the one where it is going to develop the epi, uh, where the, it is going to develop the allantois, that part you know and near the yolk sac there are 6 cells which are set apart. And around 7.25 dpc the PGC precursors are determined as PGCs in the extra embryonic me uh, membrane mesoderm at the basis of uh, allantois. The place where PGCs were first identified in human embryos around the end of the third week is the same as in the mouse that is the wall of the yolk sac near the developing allantois. So the germ cells are first determined in mammals at this particular location at the wall of the yolk sac near the developing allantois where the determination takes place and finally when the embryo is growing we will look at then then how they are migrated to the developing gonads which is there. Now before going on to the germ cell migration we will just look at some of the features that determine this germ cells you know how to differentiate how does this germ line differentiate from the somatic line apart from that you know they are uh, determined at particular places and they are determining usually extra embryonically but what are the germ cell defining features which are there. The first feature is what is explained by the inert genome hypothesis that there is a transcriptional repression that occurs in the germ cells. Germ cells are set apart from the somatic cells by general transcription repression so that none of the master regulators that make the specialized cells attain their somatic fate are expressed in the germ cells. So this is a very general formula, uh, phenomena that you know that the somatic cells as they are growing they tend to become determined and differentiate into specialized cells. For example, uh, the progenitor cell will give rise to the muscle cell. Now in the muscle cell usually there is a master regulator for example the myo-D protein. So every cell that is differentiated in a body usually have a master regulator protein which is there. So in the germ cells the transcription repression is there which will not allow these master regulators to be expressed and therefore the germ cells do not differentiate into any kind of somatic cells which is there. So that is one of the uh, defining feature. Whether in flies, chick or mice the germ cells are specified outside the developing embryo proper that is in the extra embryonic region. So this is one of the observation which we have seen. So everywhere the, the germ cells were specified outside the extra embryonic region. The isolation of the PGCs and you know one reason could be attributed to the fact that the isolation of the primordial germ cells from paracrine signaling of the growing somatic cell line. Once the repression of somatic gene expression is accomplished in the germ cells, they find their way back into the embryo and migrate to the developing gonads for maintaining themselves under differentiation. So in the initial part of the development, the germ cell lines or the precursor of the germ cells, uh, which is basically the primordial germ cells, they are set apart from the somatic line. So they reside in the extra embryonic region, they remain there until the gen, you know, cell differentiation has started taking place and rest of the somatic cells are differentiated into different cells and the gonads are developing when that stage comes in these germ cells again come back into the embryo and then migrated towards the uh, developing gonads to give rise to the gametes which is there. So you know this is one kind of an observation and this hypothesis uh, stand strong that there is an uh, inert genome which is there in the germ cell which is there. Then another defining feature is that there has to be a germline soma interaction. The germ cells on their own cannot differentiate to form the gametes. They have to regulate their sex that is whether to differentiate into a sperm or egg, proliferation for their maintenance, differentiation into a sperm or an egg and protection of the germ cell genome to maintain the continuity. So they have to you know unregulate all these phenomena and they cannot do so without the somatic cell interaction. For all these processes to occur germ cell soma interactions are very important. So for the germ cells to develop into functional gametes this germ cell somatic cells interaction has to be there. So that is also again one of the features. So PGCs have to migrate to the somatic gonads and somatic gonads have to set aside some soma cells that will associate with germ cells to facilitate this process. So that is how basically that occurs. Another defining feature of the germ cells is the conserved RNA regulators that it possess. 
the conserved rna regulators maintain the germline character in the germ cells and prevent them to go down the somatic differentiation pathway so one of the uh, one of the feature is that the uh, entire genome is repressed so that it cannot go to differentiate to form you know the cells like somatic cell is doing another thing is that there are certain kind of rna regulators which are present in the cell that will inhibit the somatic cell differentiation which which can occur so they affect all the three aspects of germ cells they affect their differentiation into gametes they affect their death and they also affect the trans differentiation into the somatic cells for example there is a protein called as nanos it is essential for maintaining germline in flies absence of nanos regulator leads to loss of translational control and so the germ cells start differentiating the absence of regulator such as dead end leads to the death of the germ cells in case of flies in c elegans simultaneous absence of two regulators which are called as max3 and gld1 leads to trans differentiation of the germ cells in the gonads wherein the germ cells lose their fate and differentiate to produce soma cells such as neural cells and muscle cells so in all the three examples basically there are certain rna regulators which are missing so there are certain you know the nanos protein or there are uh, you know the dead end protein which we are talking about or there are two regulators such as max3 and gld1 which we are talking gldi which we are talking about so these regulators are either missing or they are not functional and therefore the germ line is getting differentiated into either the somatic cell line or they are dying or you know they are giving rise to the uh, they start differentiating basically that's the thing so these certain features have to be maintained by the germ cells to remain the germ cells and you know otherwise they can be differentiated they might have been differentiated so the distinction of this germ line and somatic line has to be there so now we do the germ cell migration the germ cell migration in drosophila in drosophila as you can see the pgcs have to move from the posterior pole to gonads that are developing from the abdominal region of the embryo during early stages of embryogenesis in drosophila the hind end moves towards the dorsal side and through that germ cells are carried inside the embryo passively adhered to the moving layer of the somatic cells which will give rise to the midcut this process is called as the germ band extension next the germ cells actively move by diapedesis which is basically the squeezing amoebically through the midgut epithelium that is formed by now then the germ cells migrate from the gut endoderm to visceral medulloderm and split into the two groups as it is shown in this diagram each group then associate with one of the somatic gonads developing on either sides of the embryo so that is how you know these germ cells are taken inside and then they give rise to the two gonads which is there in case of vertebrates in zebra fish the pgcs are localized at four different clusters or quadrants as we have seen these quadrants do not correlate with any embryonic polarity and follow different routes by the end of the first day of the development the pgcs localize at two distinct clusters along the border of the trunk mesoderm and from there they move posteriorly into the developing gonad as it is shown in this particular diagram in case of frogs and toads the the uh, they collect around the vegetal pole in the zygote during cleavage this material is brought upward through the yolk cytoplasm and eventually becomes associated with the endodermal cells lining the floor of the blastocoel so usually their germ plasm is present at the furrows but then while forming the blastocoel it is taken up and they form the floor of the blastocoel which is there the pgcs become concentrated in the posterior region of the larval gut and as the abdom abdominal cavity forms they migrate along the dorsal side of the gut first along the dorsal mesentery which connects the gut to the region where the mesodermal organs are forming and then along the abdominal wall into the genital ridges they migrate up this tissue until they reach the developing gonads so in anuran amphibians this is how basically it is occurring we'll just talk about the birds right now in birds the yolk sac circulation causes in loop you know to enter the embryo via the heart as it is shown so it was present as a germinal uh, crescent at the anterior region so this green portion is now forming the loops and they enter at this stage the majority of pgc is localized axially at the border between the area opica and pellucida where the sinus terminalis converged in the anterior vitelline veins at hh 14 16 the pgc circulated effectively towards the embryo via, via the sinus terminalis and the anterior vitelline veins towards the heart 
and therefore the PGCs traffic via the iota to the caudal part of the embryo and they become lodged into the genital ridges which will then form the gonads and will give rise to the different kind of gametes. So that is how the germ cell is migrated in various organisms. Thank you. In mouse and in human beings, the germ cell specification mode is by induction mechanism. So there is no germ cell or there is no germ plasm basically which is there, no germ plasm has been observed and there is an uh, influence of the uh, neighboring cells that tends to f give rise to the germ cells. So we have already seen that how the germ cells are specified in case of mammals but we will now look at how the germ cells migrate and then we will go on to talk about the uh, formation of one of the gametes, the differentiation of the primordial germ cell into germ cell and then finally into the, uh, uh, into the, uh, gamete, the male gamete, the sperm. So we will understand the formation and maturation of the male gamete that is the sperm. So in normal mouse embryos, the germ cell precursors migrate from the extra embryonic mesoderm back into the embryo by way of the allantois. So we have already seen that you know in the case of developing mouse, uh, the, uh, there are six cells which are set aside near the you know the wall of where the allantois and the yolk sac is there. These six cells, the primordial gels, uh, germ cells are basically uh, set apart. Now these cells they move, uh, they migrate from this extra embryonic mesoderm back into the embryo by the way of allantois which is there. So after collecting at the allantois by day 7.5 DPC in the mouse, the PGCs migrate to the adjacent yolk sac. By this time they have already split into two populations that will migrate to either the right or the left genital ridge. The PGCs then move caudally from the yolk sac through the newly formed hindgut up to the dorsal mesentery into the genital ridge. Most of the PGCs have reached the developing mouse gonad by the 11th day after fertilization. During this trek, they have proliferated from an initial population of 10,100 10, cells to around 2,500 PGCs present in the gonads by day 12. So while migrating, they are also proliferating and they start migrating through the allantois and they finally reach the genital ridges which is basically present there. So that is how the movement occurs. So now when the germ cell has migrated into the developing gonads, they have to make one decision that you know either they have to undergo mitosis or meiosis. So you understand that you know mitosis is basically a cell division which is proliferating which is also equivalent to proliferation that right? when cell is giving rise to two cells. Meiosis however is a reductional division where there is a, a reduction in the chromosome number and then you know this meiosis 2 is basically equivalent to mitosis. So at the end of it 4 haploid nuclei are produced. So that is meiosis. Now for differentiation to occur and to maintain that continuity of life which we were talking about. Now these gametes which differentiate from the germ cells are going to fuse together. They are going to you know undergo the process of fertilization and then give rise to an individual adult. Now the, the adult has a diploid cell, the germ cell is a diploid cell. Now the gametes which will be formed and then when they fuse together, they have to be haploid. You know the reductional division has to take place. So differentiation of germ cells will require meiosis. However, proliferation of germ cells will require mitosis. So the germ cells has to make this decision that whether the mitosis has to occur or the meiosis has to occur. The second decision which this germ cells has to make is when the differentiation has to occur, whether it has to become a male gamete or it has to become a female gamete. So these are the decisions which the germ cells have to make when they reach the growing uh, gonads. So the, uh, the first decision which is basically between mitosis and meiosis is influenced by the uh, state of the individual, also influenced by the hormonal changes. So it is basically you know the germ cells will keep on proliferating but after reaching a particular age for example puberty in males they will start differentiating to form the sperm. And similarly in case of uh, we will talk about oogenesis when we talk about the formation of egg we will see that these 
divisions are arrested at different stages and they will need Q to you know complete their division and give rise to the gamete which is basically the egg. So today we will talk about the spermatogenesis, the formation of the sperm and we will see that you know the, uh, the age specific thing that when a male reaches puberty the, cell, the, the germ cell differentiation into sperms will start. Now deciding between whether the gamete has to be a male or a female depends upon the somatic environment in which it is placed. So you know there is a genetic mechanism behind this sex determination. So if the gonad is a testis it is going to differentiate into a sperm. And if the gonad is an ovary, then it is going to, the germ cell is going to differentiate it into an egg. Now the development of a testes and ovary will however depend upon the genetic mechanism that whether they carry an XX chromosome or an XY chromosome, the topic which we cover in the case of uh, genetics which we do. So that is how the germ cell, you know, will give rise to the different gametes. So in the gonads, these PGCs proliferate to form the germline stem cells. On one hand, these GSCs will divide mitotically to maintain themselves and the, on the other hand, they will differentiate undergoing meiosis to produce the gametes which is the sperm and the egg. So, you know, these are the two different pathways that how they are, you know, these are the basically representation of the divisions which this germ cell will undergo and we will talk in detail about these two mechanisms that whether they are giving rise to the sperm or whether they are giving rise to the egg which is there. So, we will start talking about the formation of the sperm, the production of the male gamete, a mature sperm is termed as the spermatogenesis. We will look at the formation of sperm matids first after arriving at the genital ridges of the developing embryo. So, you know it was the PGCs were set apart at the, uh, at the stage of the growing embryo near that yolk sac and the allantoic region. They have migrated now towards the growing genital ridges. Now these genital regions when they arrive at, they in PGCs incorporate into the sex cords and they remain there until maturity. So when the maturity occur, the sex cords become hollow to form what are called as the seminiferous tubules. The epithelium of the seminiferous tubules differentiate to become specialized cells which are called as the Sertoli cells that nourish and protect the developing sperm cells. So you can see in the diagram that there are certain Sertoli cells which are present in between these germ cells which are there. The spermatogenic germ cells are termed as the spermatogonia. So particularly the germ and we will you know uh, the, the, the germ cells which will give rise to the egg are called as the oogonia. So spermatogonia are the spermatogenic germ cells. Spermatogonia are bound to the Sertoli cells and spermatogenesis occurs in the recesses between the Sertoli cells. So in the, in the uh, gaps between the Sertoli cells, the spermatogenesis will occur. So this is a section of uh, uh, seminiferous tubule which you can see, you know, so at the base there is a basement membrane and then there is a spermatogonia and then there are different cells which are there and then in the lumen you can see the sperms which is basically present. So in the in this diagram basically tells you that how the spermatids are formed. So looking in detail into it, the spermatogonia are now capable of self renewal. They divide mitotically to produce more spermatogonia. The initiation of spermatogenesis during puberty. So as I said, you know, the decision between whether a mitosis, now the decision, they are dividing mitotically because they are germ cells. So they keep on dividing, they will give rise to more spermatogonial cells. Now a decision has to come that now they have to undergo meiosis and they have to form the gametes. So that decision depends upon that when the individual has reached puberty. And the underlying molecules which play a role is for example such as the synthesis of BMP6, BMP8B which is there. So the initiation of spermatogenesis during puberty is probably regulated by the synthesis of this BMP8B molecule by the spermatogenic germ cells, the spermatogonia. When BMP8B reaches a critical concentration, the germ cells begin to differentiate. The differentiating cells produce high levels of BMP which can then further stimulate their differentiation. Mice lacking BMP do not initiate spermatogenesis at puberty. So you know that is the cue. 
the increased concentration of BMP 8 B molecule is the cue that now they have to switch from the mitosis. Some of the uh, some of the cells will still undergo meiosis, but then uh, mitosis, but then the meiosis also has to occur for the formation of the gametes. At the onset of the puberty, some spermatogonia will differentiate to become what are called as the primary spermatocytes. The cells that enter the meiosis. Each primary spermatocyte undergoes first meiotic division which is the reductional division to produce a pair of secondary spermatocytes. And this secondary spermatocytes complete the second meiotic division to produce four haploid cells called as the spermatids. So, there is a spermatogonial cell, there is a primary spermatocyte, there is a secondary spermatocyte and there is a spermatid that is formed. Spermatogonial cell is a diploid cell and that is a germ cell which is basically there which is capable of self renewal. It will undergo a division to form what is called as the primary spermatocyte. Primary spermatocyte is the cell which will undergo meiosis. The first meiotic division, reductional division giving rise to the secondary uh, spermatocyte which is now haploid set of chromosomes, contains haploid set of chromosomes which is the number n which is there and this secondary spermatocyte will again undergo meiosis 2 which is equivalent to mitosis to give rise to 4 haploid spermatids which are there. And during the divisions from spermatogonium to spermatid, the cells move further and further away from the basement membrane as it is clear from the diagram uh, of the seminiferous tubule and closer to the lumen. Thus, each layer of tubule is composed of a specific type of cell. The spermatids are located at the border of the lumen where they differentiate to form the mature spermatozoa which are then released into the lumen. So, there is a kind of a hierarchy in the seminiferous tubules and the uh, mature sperms are released into the lumen of the seminiferous tubules. Now, these spermatids are nothing like the mature sperm. So, the differentiation of the spermatid has to take place to form a functional mature sperm and this process is termed as spermiogenesis or spermiteliosis. The spermatid is a round unflagellated cell that does not resemble mature sperm at all. The process of differentiation of a spermatid to a mature sperm is termed spermiogenesis or spermateliosis. For fertilization to occur, now the sperm has to meet and bind with the egg. Spermiogenesis basically prepares the spermatid cells for these functions of motility and interaction. So, the basically the gamete, you know, the basic idea of meiosis was basically to reduce the, uh, the uh, chromosome number. So, the gametes are haploid that has been attained till the formation of spermatids. Spermatids are haploid, but functionally they are still non-functional because of their uh, features. They are non-flagellated, they are round. So, this feature change which make it into mature sperm which is, which is capable to perform its function of motility and interaction with the egg, you know, to cause fertilization that mechanism and that processes basically that are involved is termed as the spermiogenesis. So, we will look at what changes does occur in a spermatid that it give rise to a mature spermatozoa. But before that we need to understand the structure of a sperm. So, if we look at the structure of a sperm there are three distinct regions. There is a head, there is a middle piece and there is a tail. So, in the head most of the part is occupied by a nucleus and on the head of the head you know the anterior portion of the head contains a vesicle uh, a sac like structure which is called as acrosome. These this acrosome contains proteolytic enzymes which is very useful because the sperm has to go interact with the egg and then you know egg is we will see when we will uh, do the oogenesis that the egg is surrounded by a lot of membranes. So, the sperm has to invade all those membranes, it has to digest all those membranes so that the plasma membrane, it can reach the plasma membrane of the egg. Because the ultimate aim of the fusion of the sperm and egg is basically the mixing of the two nuclei. So, the two nucleus, nuclei need to come together. So, the sperm has to invade and digest all these membranes and then reach up to the egg. So, for this invasion basically it is carrying this acrosome which contain proteolytic enzymes which will cause localized 
protein degradation and localized membrane degradation so that the sperm can pave its way up to the egg where it can meet the plasma membrane. Then there is a middle piece and as you can see in the middle piece it is rich in mitochondria. There are two layers of the mitochondria. In between the nucleus and the middle piece there, is, there are centrioles that lie. There are two, centri two pairs of centrioles which are present in this region. One is which is present near to the uh, uh, nucleus is said to be the proximal centriole pair and the other one which is perpendicular to the proximal centriole pair is called as the distal centriole pair. So there are these centrioles are the ones which will give rise to the spindle fibers when it get enters into the egg. So these centrioles also basically go inside the proximal centriole goes into the egg and there they tend to form the spindle for the first cleavage division which needs to occur. Then there is a row of mitochondria on both the sides and these mitochondria are basically for energy generation. So because the sperm has to you know uh, cover the distance and reach the egg, it does not carry too much of baggage. All it contains is a nucleus which is the genetic material that is the primary aim of the sperm to take the genetic material and fuse it with the egg's genetic material and for this it needs a uh, energy. So only mitochondrial layer is there. So there are two rows of mitochondria which is present on either side of the exoneme which forms the flagella. So for the motility this flagella is there also there which is present. So most of the part of the head region is occupied by the haploid nucleus. In front of the nucleus is an acrosome filled with proteolytic enzyme is placed. In sea urchin sperms, actin protein is found between the nucleus and the acrosome. So we will see that you know this actin protein actually aids in the uh, dissolution of the uh, of the egg membranes when the um, sea urchin sperm tries to reach the egg when the fertilization is occurring. So this act actin protein will give rise to a filament that will aid in the uh, in the digestion in the in making the way for the sperm to reach the egg. And here again you can see that you know there is a difference in the head region or that is basically the front view and the side view. So there is a, uh, uh, there is a tail which is present and uh, at the end of the mitochondria there is a terminal disc which is there and there is a ring centriole that is present there called as the Jensen's ring. So that is basically uh, preventing the collapse of the mitochondria into the nucleus which is there. So there is a nucleus which is present, there is an acrosome which is present and then there is a periacrosomal space, there is a post acrosomal region which is there, there are two centrioles at the neck re in the neck region which is present, there are connecting pieces which are there, there is a mitochondrial sheath, there are outer dense fibers which are there and this tail if we look at, you know the sperm tail if we look at it contains this typical 9 plus 2 arrangement which is there. Uh, so you can see the section of the horizontal section of the uh, cross section of the sperm tail which is shown and it is giving rise to a typical 9 plus 2 uh, arrangement and the, uh, the uh, uh, each of this uh, microtubule doublet contains A and B you know there is an A doublet and there is a B the main protein is the tubulin which is again shown that microtubule A is formed by the tubulin monomer and the tubulin monomers are there alpha tubulin monomer and beta tubulin monomer. So tubulin is the main protein but apart from that there are other uh, proteins such as the dynein arm. If you can see there is an inner dynein arm and there is an outer dynein arm which is present. The importance of dynein can be seen in the individuals with the genetic syndrome called as the Cartagener, Cart Cartagener triad. These individuals lack dynein on all their ciliated and flagellated cells rendering these structures immotile. So the sperms they produce because their, uh, their flagella is not moving they are basically you know uh, uh, non-functional sperms that they generate and they usually die of the respiratory failure etc. because their respiratory cilia are non-movable, immovable because of these uh, the defect in this dynein protein which is present in this particular flagella which is there. So this is how the structure of the sperm looks like. So there is a head, there is a middle piece, there is a tail. Now a round unflagellated cell needs to differentiate it into this particular kind of a structure. So we will look at what are the changes that are occurring. So the primarily the changes that involved is in the present in the nucleus. In the nucleus the genetic content is condensing and expelling most of the cytoplasm. So in the head region what remains in the nucleus what remains is only the genetic material and most of the cytoplasm is thrown out there are no other organelles which are basically present. 
One of the major changes in the nucleus is the replacement of the histones by protamines. Transcription of the gene for protamine is seen in the early haploid cells, although translation is delayed for several days. Protamines are relatively small proteins that are over 60% arginine. During spermiogenesis, the nucleosomes dissociate and the histones of the haploid nucleus are eventually replaced by these protein protamines. These, this causes the complete shutdown of transcription in the nucleus and facilitates its assuming as almost a crystalline structure. The resulting sperm then enter the lumen of the tubule. So, you know that is the major change which is occurring in the, in the nucleus of the spermatid that the material is condensing the entire nucleoplasm is thrown out and the condensation of the genetic material takes place by the replacement of the histones by these proteins which are called as the protamines. Then an important structure which is what is there is called as the acrosome. So now the acrosome formation also occurs. They are derived from the Golgi apparatus and contain enzymes that digest proteins and complex sugars. You can, so you can see that there is a spermated which is there and in this spermated this Golgi apparatus they start orienting themselves at one end of the nucleus. Then there are some acrosomal granules which try which, which start coalescing and they kind of you know keep on from the Golgi apparatus they take the sacs and these sacs start fusing and forming a kind of vesicle around these granules. So the acrosome vesicle and granules keep, uh, keep form uh, form forming and at this particular time the entire, uh, entire nucleus just goes a you know uh, 180 degree rotation so that the centrioles comes to lie at the part where the tail leads to develop and not in the head portion. So, it tends to get on the opposite side. So, you can see that there is a growing flagellum which is there. So, the central part is still there and then it goes a complete reversal so that the central comes to lie near where the flagella is developing. Then there is a Golgi rest which is which is basically the Golgi ghost you know the part of the vesicles which are still remaining that is thrown out of the cell which is there and then eventually it tends to you know the flagella is keeps on growing. Then the mitochondria you can see they start arranging around the exoneme of the mitochondria and then in the later stages you know the mitochondria has arranged the most part of the cytoplasm just pinches off and there is a very little cytoplasm which lies in the periacrosomal phase uh, space which is there. So now the entire head is occupied by the nucleus there is an acrosome that has formed so these vesicles fuse together to give rise and they contain these hydrolytic enzymes. The mitochondria has arranged themselves into the middle piece and that growing flagella has now become a proper tail containing that end piece where the exoneme is not there. So the acrosome formation is again an important aspect of the differentiation of the sperm. The differentiation of mammalian sperm is not completed in the testes. After being expelled into the lumen of the seminiferous tubules, the sperm are stored in the epididymis where they acquire the ability to move. Motility is achieved through changes in the ATP generating system, possibly through the modification of the dynein arms which we saw as well as changes in the plasma membrane that makes it more fluid. So initially the sperm is not motile although the differentiation has occurred and probably it has formed the structure but the motility is still there and the motility um, occurs later on when the uh, modifications occur probably in such as the dynein arms etc. The sperm is released during ejaculation are able to move however they do not yet have the capacity to bind and fertilize the egg. These final stages of sperm maturation which are also termed as capacitation do not occur until the sperm has been inside the female reproductive tract for a certain period of time. We will look about the uh, we will talk about the uh, features of this phenomena called as capacitation when we are doing fertilization but, but the basic thing is the sperm is active the sperm is motile but still it is not able to fuse the egg until it remains in the female tract for some period of time. In the mouse this entire development process from stem cell to spermatozoan takes 34.5 days. The spermatogonian stage lasts 8 days, the meiosis lasts 13 days and the spermiogenesis takes around another 13.5 days which is basically there. So in total around 34.5 days it is taken in the mouse for the entire sperm uh, production which is there. 
in human spermatic development takes nearly twice as long to complete. Each day some 100 million sperms are made in each human testicle and each ejaculation releases around 200 million sperms. Unused sperms are either resorbed or passed out of the body in urine. During his lifetime, a human male can produce around 10 raised to the power of 12, uh, there is a typo there, 10 raised to the power of 12 to 10 raised to the power of 13 sperms basically during his lifetime is that they can produce. So this is a picture of basically different kinds of sperm. This is from the Calicot General Embryology book. So these are the different kinds of, you know, just to appreciate the different uh, uh, structures of sperms which are found in the entire animal kingdom. Uh, the first A and B one shows for the fish, a teleost fish. The C and D are the sperms for birds. The E, F and F are the, are the uh, sperms of snail. The G is basically the sperm of an ascaris uh, worm. The H is for an annulate. I is for bat. The J is for opossum. So you can look at the uh, structure of an sperm of an opossum. Uh, the K is the typical rat one. So we will talk about basically the fertilization. Usually we are talking about the rat. Uh, L is how the uh, sperm of a salamander looks like. And M, N, O, P, you know, there's a whole variety of sperms if we look at for the crustaceans, which is there. So the small k represents the end knob, the W is the middle piece and the U is the undulatory membrane, which is there. So these are the different kinds of sperms which are there. Now, last important point which I want to make here is that male spermatogenesis meiosis is different from when we will talk about is distinct in some points or some features when we will talk about the female because meiosis is a very important formula, phenomena when the uh, germ cell maturation into gametes has to take place. We have already talked about that. So we will just look at some of the features of the male spermatogenesis meiosis. The meiosis is initiated continuously in a mitotically dividing cell population. So there are spermatogonian cells which are continuously mitotically dividing. But meiosis is also initiated continuously when the puberty has reached, when the differentiation has started. Four gametes are produced at the end of meiosis and we will see in the oogenesis only one egg is produced per cell. Meiosis completed in usually days or weeks. However, it will take long amount of time in case of uh, uh, you know, it takes uh, four weeks when the maturation has started, but initially it is arrested at different stages. Meiosis and differentiation proceed continuously without cell cycle arrest. So there are arrests at different cell cycle stages in case of oogenesis. We will have a look at that. But in case of spermatogenesis, the meiosis as well as differentiation, they proceed continuously without cell cycle arrest. The differentiation of gamete occurs while haploid, you know, after the meiosis and ends. So we have already seen that spermated was a haploid cell and then the differentiation occurred so that it became a mature spermatozoan. But it was already a haploid cell and then the differentiation occurred and sex chromosomes are excluded from recombination and transcription during the first meiotic prophase. So the sex chromosomes are not included, only rest of the autosomes are included in the recombination portion which is occurring in the germ cell meiosis and the differentiation that is undergoing. So this is all about how the sperm is matured and how the sperms, is, uh, sperms are basically formed, a mature spermatozoa is formed or the entire phenomenon of spermatogenesis. Thank you. On that note, I would like to thank ma'am for this very enriching discussion and thank you dear friends for watching our show. Stay tuned and keep watching. Thank you. Mm -hmm.